Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the Public Programs and Events Manager here at the International Documentary Association. I um, want to thank you all for joining us this evening um, for this great conversation uh, about ESPN's The Last Dance. Um, before we get started, just a few things. Um, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, I am coming to you today from Los Angeles which is on the occupied land of the Tongva and the Chumash people who have been stewards of this land for generations. We would like to take a moment and recognize the indigenous people on whose land we stand on today. And just a few housekeeping rules. Um, the chat has been disabled, but you can uh, submit your questions for the panel via the Q&A function down at the bottom. Um, we'll be going through those and we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for audience questions. Um, we will read those out loud for you. Um, this is also being recorded. Um, we will post the video in a week or two on our YouTube page. So stay tuned um, for that so you can share it with your friends. Um, and we have one last event coming up next Monday. Um, you can RSVP and check it out on our website, documentary.org. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to hand things off to um, Eric Deggins from NPR, who is our moderator for the evening. Hi, Eric. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks so much, Cassidy. And uh, welcome to our panel discussion uh, about uh, The Last Dance. Um, I'm going to be speaking with director-producer Jason Hare, uh, producer Mike Tallon, and producer Nina Kirstick. Uh, about this amazing documentary, uh, which I loved. I, I, first of all, I want to thank you guys for giving me something sports related to watch in the middle of the lockdown. You saved my life and the life of a lot of sports fans by giving us some uh, something new to watch uh, that's sports related. So thanks so much for that. Um, an examination of uh, Michael Jordan's last championship run uh, with the Chicago Bulls. Uh, and uh, and an, an amazing behind the scenes look as well, because you guys had about 500 hours of behind the scenes footage of these guys uh, practicing and, uh, and getting ready and, and enacting this amazing run in 1997 uh, through 1998. Uh, and you also had interviews with the man himself, uh, Michael Jordan. So I guess the first question I have to ask, as the legend goes, uh, Michael Jordan had control over the use of the footage and could approve uh, whether or not someone could use it and had not given his permission, even though many people had tried to get that permission. Mike, from what I hear, you got him to say yes. So what'd you tell him? Well, there's two part of that question where I thought you were going, Eric, uh, <laughs> uh, is, is about the creative content of the show. And I'll let Jason handle that one later because that one became sort of a big uh, brouhaha afterwards. And, uh, you know, I don't believe everything you hear. Um, as for his consent to participating, yeah, it was kind of legendary. I remember uh, doing a show called Arliss way back in the dark ages, 1999. A friend of mine named Frank Marshall was telling me, hey, you know, they recorded that championship season the previous year, 97, 98. And he was doing an IMAX film and, there was this thing buzzing all around. Somebody was going to get the rights to do this. And Michael wasn't interested. And um, the story that I've, uh, I've told and these guys have heard a million times, um, it's, 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 there's two guys that are critical to the origin story. Um, the first one is Andy Thompson, who's the brother of Michael Thompson, a two-time NBA champ with the Showtime Lakers, also the uncle of Clay Thompson. And Michael was a field producer, excuse me, Andy was a field producer back then. And he realized that the next season, 97, 98, was going to be historic. Whether they won or lost, it was going to be the end, literally the last dance. And so he went to his boss, the head of NBA entertainment at the time, who's none other than Adam Silver, who of course now is the NBA commissioner. And Adam loved the idea, went through the ranks of the Bulls front office, and finally you know, it all pointed to Michael. It was down to him. Everybody else had consented. And Adam kind of knew it was going to be difficult. So he said, look, Michael, if you let us shoot with you, we promise not to do anything with it unless and until 
you can say. And if you don't, then you'll have the greatest collection of home movies ever. And that's pretty much what it was for about 18 years. Um, and then in 2016, um, we began the, uh, the frontal assault, the full on assault, which was really kind of based on um, the changing of the documentary landscape. I mean, these guys know this. We are all, and probably most of the people on the Zoom are the beneficiaries in this increased appetite for documentaries. It used to be, you know, less is more. Get, get, get in your 75 or 90 minutes and get out. And now all of a sudden it's like, how many hours can you give us? So we had just seen the Jinx on HBO and uh, How to Make a Murderer was 10 hours on Netflix and the eight part OJ series had just premiered at Sundance. The month before I sat down in Toronto in February, 2016 with Michael's partners, Esty Portnoy and Curtis Polk. It took us a long time. There was a, 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 a long courtship. I was finally allowed behind the curtain to see the wizard. And, um, there's some great moments. I'm not going to bore you with the whole story, but there were a couple of really great moments when he sat down to read the lookbook that I presented. Um, he reached behind him and said, wait, 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 let me get my reading glasses. And there's that reality check. Like, <laughs> wait, reading glasses? I can't be. Um, and we went through it. And, you know, my pitch was basically there are all these people that come into my office every day who've never seen you play, and it's time. And um, I think he saw that this would be a multi-part documentary event, that we would have a chance to really understand his motivation, the way he treated his players, which I think he was a little bit reluctant to reveal, um, would now be maybe understood as um, just his way of trying to elevate their play and increase their intensity and get them up to the same level that, that he brought every day. So. Um, I have to say, and Jason can speak to it because he's the one that sat there and asked him all those questions for eight hours. Um, <laughs> he could have been more into it. He couldn't have been more eager and willing and ready to answer anything Jason threw at him. So, um, you know, we were very lucky. So Jason, you know, what strikes me, uh, uh, what struck me about um, the doc when I first watched it, the very first image is we're sneaking up behind Michael and we're seeing those broad shoulders and we're seeing him hold that cigar and it leaves no doubt who is the star of this particular production. <laughs> and, and, and when you think about it, that footage, which he controlled and his interviews were some of the most notable things that you guys produced uh, for this documentary. Talk a little bit about interviewing Michael uh, and, uh, and realizing how important he was to the success of this project well clearly he was he's he's the keystone to the entire thing if, if, if you take that jenga piece out the whole tower falls down um this is the story of the bulls dynasty seen through the lens of the 97 98 season but it undoubtedly stars uh, michael jordan um so it was it was uh you mentioned that that first shot i mean th that was his people were, were smart enough to put me in front of him a few times before we actually uh, rolled cameras. So I met Michael for the first time about nine months before we even sat down uh, with, with cameras rolling. Um, and this was just to kind of measure our rapport. It was almost like a, a, a low level screen test, if you want to call it that. Uh, and we met up a couple of other times. He would be in New York and I would get a call, you know, come to the, come to the hotel and have a drink with Michael or, or, um, we're going to the Barclays Center, hop in the SUV and talk to him on the way over and hang out in the, in the suite with him for a little bit. Uh, it, was a, it was a really advantageous move because when he walked in that day, he knew my face. He doesn't know, he didn't know me well. He doesn't know me well now, but he knew that he could trust me because we had, we had spoken before. He knew that he was, you know, he, he knew that he was in a safe place if he was going to talk to me about some difficult things. And certainly that's, that was one of the goals um, of this project was to go to the places where a lot of people didn't think that we would go. So, you know, it's a different, there were, th there were three interviews and there were three different strategies for those interviews because the first one, we honestly had no idea. Is he going to stay for a half hour? Is he going to stay for an hour? Is he going to stay for three hours? Because mm -hmm. he can pull the plug whenever he wants. He's Michael Jordan. If he says, I don't feel like doing this anymore, he's going to get up and he's going to leave. And there's nothing I can say or do to keep him in that chair. So we had little side bets of how long is it going to last over under two hours? <laughs> um, 
how many f bombs is he gonna drop? Uh, <laughs> will he cry? Won't he cry? All sorts of side bets <laughs> that, that the crew and I had just to keep ourselves loose. Because I'll be honest, that's the most nervous I've ever been, uh, certainly in this business and maybe ever. Because it's not because he's Michael Jordan. Because that that's you know there is a, a an element of being starstruck when you first see someone who is a two-dimensional character your whole life who's a poster on a wall or an image on a t-shirt or a logo on a shoe and you meet them in real life, it becomes real. But it was so crucial that that first interview go really, really well. It wasn't enough to have it be, you know, a B plus. It has to go really, really well because we desperately need that content from him for our editors to work and to do what they need to do. And also he needs to leave that interview on a positive note thinking, I don't mind going back for more because there's no way that we can get 10 hours of material out of him in one interview. He was contracted for two interviews and we ended up doing three. So it was an enormous amount of pressure that day, but uh, I, credit, I credit our team uh, on the ground that the camera crew we had is, is second to none and the producers we had there are second to none. Uh, it was a small group, but it was, it was a hand-picked important group. And then I credit the people back in New York because I, all I can do is get all of that footage and, and bring that original interview to our editors and to Nina and have Nina, who is the best on the planet at getting ancillary footage and complimentary footage and, 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 and archival footage. She's our archival producer and, you know, concocting this, this stew of what a documentary is going to become. But it all, it all centered around that day. If that day doesn't go well, June 26, 2018 will forever be etched in my brain. Because if that <laughs> doesn't go well, it all falls apart. Second interview, strategic. We had 90 minutes with him, we were told. So I was literally interrupting him certain time. When he was giving us answers that he had already given or that I knew we wouldn't use, I would have to cut him off and say, I, I, I'm sorry, man, we're on the clock. I need to, I need to ask you this, this, and this. And then the third interview was we knew what we needed for, to, to round out the story. So several different, um, several different strategies going in, but that first one, I will never forget that. I'll bet, I'll bet. So, so Nina, can you talk a little bit about the challenge of now you've got all this material that you've got to shape around these very important interviews uh, and the and, and the practice footage that they got. Um, what was the biggest challenge in figuring out how to collate all that stuff and organize it and make it make sense as a story? Um, I mean, I think it was the sheer amount. Um, I think we ended up with 10,000 hours of footage and that's not everything. That's just what we pulled into our system. So that's what we deemed was good enough. <laughs> um, wow. So, I mean, I've always sort of approached my job with, you know, it's not my job to get everything possible out there. It's my job to curate enough so that the editors are not overwhelmed with footage. Because if you just throw, you know, every single camera of a game, let's say, at an editor, he's just going to drown. Like, it's not efficient. Um, so I've always, you know, thought about how to make it streamlined. So when you're dealing with 10 thousand hours of footage to make that streamlined is incredibly difficult. Um, so we had two amazing associate producers. We had a huge database um, where we logged every piece of footage, um, every important bite. And we spent, you know, the first interview was on June 26. We started working in January and we started pulling in all the footage. So we spent, and the edit I think started in September, right? So we spent the first nine months making sure everything was searchable and traceable. Um, so mm -hmm. if an editor needed a specific thing, all it took was a click and, you know, text search, okay, here it is. Um, obviously, once the edit starts, it becomes its own beast and you need to start pulling new things in as stories develop. But being sort of able to take that time up front and make sure things are searchable is invaluable. That's amazing. So um, one of the things about someone like Michael Jordan is that they have a very practiced public persona. And of course, your job as documentarians is to get past that. And so I'm wondering, what did you learn about Michael Jordan uh, that maybe we didn't know until you sat down with him to do the interviews for this doc? I, I can start. There was an epiphany that we had, um, myself and... and um, and Nina and, and Chad Beck, who was our lead editor, 
and Jake Rogal, who was our lead producer. And there was a morning I remember that I was walking to work because I was lucky enough that our edit facility is, is less than a mile from where I live. And mm -hmm. I'm walking to work and I'm thinking, what is this about? If you had to say what this is about, not as it's about the bulls, it's about what, what is the theme? What is this about? The common denominator with all of these guys was that they were underdogs. At one point or another, they were underdogs. And the more that I talked to Michael, first of all, the more human he became because the more time you spend with someone, the, the less of an icon they become and the more of a human being they become. But I learned that looking back on it, I was a child of the 90s. So I just took it as a you know, cultural generational birthright that the Bulls are in the finals in June in the 90s most of the time. And they ran roughshod through the Eastern and Western conferences. And they won you know, six out of eight titles in, in, in those, that eight year span. And then it came easy for them because they just, they just uh, plowed over everybody. Each of those circumstances in each of those seasons was tremendously difficult and fraught with with issues on and off the floor so when you talk to these these guys specifically michael to get back to your question it was way more difficult than i remember it because you think that michael is this gifted athlete and this, this preternatural talent he may not have been in the top two athletes on the bulls but dennis robin and scotty pippen you can make a very good argument they were better athletes than michael jordan so I think that, that get ready for your Twitter mentions to just blow up, man. Sure, just tell sure. Me. And, I'll, and I'll defend it, and I'll de I'll defend it. They're not they're not better basketball players. He's ready. I forgot you work you work with ESPN. You're used to this. Go ahead. We had we had some experience with Twitter in the last few months, so I'm 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 ready. I'm ready to to bob and weave. Um, but I think to, to answer your question, what came across to me is that this was, it's difficult for anyone. And that goes for LeBron, that goes for Bill Russell, that goes for Jerry West, that goes for Michael, that this is not just handed to you, that you're the best basketball player on the planet at the time and you just happen to win titles. He was struggling from, to, to be the best from the time that he was not 21 years old, not 15 years old, from the time that he wanted to beat his brother Larry in the backyard so bad that he was crying when he went inside when he was six years old. So that, to me, is, is what I learned about him, is that he's human just like the rest of us, but he had the perseverance to make himself as great as he is. I, I think the, um, the examination of greatness um, is what this documentary presents as well as any, maybe. Um, and to Jason's credit, um, he really went after it in some interesting ways. You know, when he asked, um, what was the, do you feel bad about the cost in your human relationships uh, due to your intensity, due to your relentless behavior, due to the way you drove your players, picked on them, the names they call him, the behavior that they document, the abuse they suffered, the black eye that Steve, had, Steve Kerr had, for instance. Um, that's the now infamous end of episode seven, the last two minutes of change, which has been replayed over and over and over and clipped off by you know the captains and kings of industry and sports leaders and coaches and all saying this is what greatness demands well it doesn't necessarily but it did for michael and he knew himself and he figured out you know way back when in the backyard with his brother larry how much he wanted to win and how much it took of himself to be the best that he could be he talks about you know, getting suspended from school and getting in trouble and his father threatening the removal of privileges, including sports, if he didn't straighten out. And all of a sudden, like, you know, he became a model citizen because he wanted to make sure um, his, you know, his, his, his sports uh, career, you know, could continue. And you hear all these different, like Jason said, um, each level was another assault, right? Like James Worthy, um, who was the incumbent best player in North Carolina, says, you know, when Michael got there as a freshman, I was the best player on the, on the Tar Heels for about two weeks, right? And then there goes Michael right by him. How long did it take him as a rookie in 1984? By Christmas, he was not only the rookie year, but maybe the best player in the league already. Um, so, you know, the expression GOAT for, for people out there who aren't sports fans, I don't know if that expression is even used outside of sports, really. Stands for greatest of all time. Did not exist back then, I don't believe. It's way overblown. The conversation is uh, incessant, it seems like. This 
show certainly inspired the dialogue between Michael and generally between Michael and LeBron. But the great thing is Michael answers to himself and he's never gonna talk about, uh, am I the GOAT? LeBron seems to wanna entertain that himself and has proclaimed himself that. You'll never hear from Michael. And there, there's something really pure and wonderful about it. He's, you know, he's answering to himself, his peers, his teammates, his family, um, but you know, he leaves that debate to everybody else. So um, I will note that you guys got criticism from Ken Burns, of all people, uh, for having Michael Jordan's production company officially involved with uh, what you were doing. Uh, in, in a weird way, it might feel like you're getting criticized by Mr. Rogers or something, but um, he did say that allowing a subject to have as much control as Michael Jordan uh, seemed to have uh, over the project uh, wasn't necessarily a great idea. And, and Jason, you said yourself, if he had decided to stop participating or cut an interview short or withdrew his participation, the whole thing would have collapsed. What do you say to people who say uh, that as good as uh, this documentary is, there, there's, there's something uh, troubling about allowing a subject to have that much control uh, over whether or not you can even uh, present the documentary? First of all, what I said was that if he wanted to get up during the interview and walk out, there's nothing that I could say to compel him to sit back down in the chair. And that goes for any of the 106 people that we interviewed. Second, we interviewed 106 people. Um, we attempted and I think uh, succeeded at presenting as comprehensive a story as we possibly could about the Bulls dynasty through the lens of the 97, 98 season. The whole project inherently was contingent upon Michael's approval of releasing this footage from 97, 98 and the NBA's approval. So if you wanna go back to that, and first of all, I should say that Ken Burns and I have spoken, this is not a response to Ken Burns. Ken Burns and I have spoken, he, he couldn't have been more gracious when he called and said that he was taken out of context and he was speaking in terms of PBS's guidelines versus documentaries as a whole. But if Michael doesn't give that permission to have this footage be seen, then the documentary doesn't exist. So do you proceed with that condition that it's Michael's permission for this to be seen or do you not do the doc at all? I will say this, there wasn't one frame that Michael Jordan or his people ever said, take that out. Never once, there was never one question. There was never one question that I was told not to ask Michael by him or his people. There was never one topic that was off limits. We went to difficult places. We went to gambling. We went to uh, his father's death. We went to the rumor that uh, his gambling was the, re was his father's death was the result of his gambling. We went to whether or not he was suspended. We went to how difficult a player he was. We showed very unflattering moments of him from that 97, 98 footage that I was surprised I was crossing my fingers and, and hoping that no one would actually drop the hammer, but the hammer never dropped. So we pushed hard to explore these stories. At, at the outset of this thing, I feared that it would be, I was told it was, it's just 97, 98. Um, some things are gonna be off limits. You know, We pushed very hard for years. July, 2016 is when this first crossed my desk when Mike brought me out to dinner. And we pushed hard for years to pursue the storylines that we pursued. And I am very proud of where we landed. I'm extremely proud of how hard the entire team worked to have as comprehensive and responsible a doc as possible. You're talking to Nina Kerstich who is responsible for every frame of footage that was not an interview in the OJ doc. You're talking about ESPN, who was, besides Oscars, how many prizes and awards did they win for that OJ doc? These are people who are not going to give up their reputations easily. Every single person came in here knowing that we would receive this criticism. And I can speak for all of us when we say that we're proud of the final product. All right. Anyone else want to speak to that or? Did a pretty good job there, Jason. So uh, one of the things that struck me about this, and you alluded to it a little bit earlier, I love these moments when you uh, hand Michael a, an iPad and say, hey, this person said this, or this person said that. And it struck me that you had to sort of set up how you were doing these interviews so that you would have that 
those interviews ready so that you could show him what other people had said. So can you talk a little bit about, I mean, was that something that you just, that kind of came to you? Did, when you were scheduling these interviews, did you plan to work it that way so that you would have a bunch of stuff that you could have him react to? Um, how did you come up with those moments where you handed him an iPad and had him uh, listen to his mother reading a letter he sent from college or listening to Jerry Reisdorf explaining why he decided to get rid of the team after their championship season? The genesis of the idea was, was the second time that I hung out with Michael and we were discussing whether or not he'd ever been ejected from a game and the fights that he had gotten in when he played. And I pulled my phone out and I called up a YouTube clip. It was a six or seven minute clip set to music of all of the Michael Jordan confrontations. And my brother and I used to watch this like to pump each other up because it was like, it's set to a, it's, there's brilliant editors out there who, who no one's ever heard of who are putting stuff on YouTube that's, that's, that's uh, transcendent. So this was one of those clips that was like, it makes you want to run through a wall. I called that up and I was watching it and I was saying, this is the fight you're talking about. He took the phone out of my hand and he locked in. And he started muttering to himself and he started telling little, it was like, it was like director's commentary of these fights from Michael Jordan, who's in these fights wow. with Reggie Miller and John Starks and Danny Ainge and, and the list goes on. And I remember thinking to myself, if, if we can recreate this moment, like this is the kind of moment I'm going to tell my brothers about, or tell my friends about, or tell my coworkers about, if we can recreate this moment and let the audience feel this, then we're on to something that's, that's fun and informative and everything that we want this story to be. So that's where the genesis of the idea came from. Before the second and third interviews, um, Nina and I would go, I would sit down with Nina and go through all of the archival stuff that we wanted to show. So if it's the walk off, if it's, um, you know, his performance against the Sonics in, in 96, uh, we would go through every permutation. There's a lot of iPad stuff that didn't, that didn't make air because it didn't work. We'd show it to him and he'd be like, yeah, well that happened and, and there was no response. The other uh, reason why the tool was effective is that I don't care who you are, when you're being interviewed for two or three hours at a time, it gets boring and it gets monotonous and I could start to see him sag in his chair or he, his voice would lower an octave or his energy was gone. That was a toy. That was, that was something that it was almost a portal back to 90s MJ that I could pull that out and be like, all right, enough of that. Watch this. Hit play on this. And all of a sudden, there's no one who likes games more than Michael Jordan, regardless of the stakes. He just wants to play a game. All right, let's play a game. I'm going to play you something here and you give me your honest response. Um, so it, it, it worked on a lot of levels, but it all came from that first day when I was talking about his fights and, and showed him some examples. And then he was, you can tell that, that part of him is living in 2020 and part of that the heart of MJ, that the, the 90s MJ is living in the past. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, we are talking about one of the most interviewed, you know, man on the planet. So, yeah. you know, people, He's very media savvy, but he also is just kind of tired of it. You know, he's been interviewed every day of his life for a long time. So how do you break him out of that? And, you know, Jason was very smart. It's like, you can't control your reactions. And when memories come flooding back, it's very natural and it's very real. And it's not something that you just sort of, you know, shoot off. You actually have a real reaction. It came from, another thing is that it came from, my mom was telling me, as we were shooting this, I went home and my mom was telling me that when we were kids, they would bring us to church and that we were toddlers, we get bored every five minutes. And she said, we have to give you a matchbox car here and then a bag of Cheerios here and then a dangly thing here or a rattle here. These were matchbox cars and Cheerios and things to keep them occupied, shiny objects to keep them because it's, it's like Nina said, there's no question I asked him that in some way, shape or form, he hasn't been asked before. So the, the question became, all right, how do we make this as fresh as possible for him and for the audience's sake? Right. So, so you're saying you treated Michael Jordan like a toddler. Okay. <laughs> no, um, no, what's interesting to, well, I was, gonna, I was just gonna say, what's interesting to me about the doc is, is um, I had that reaction as a viewer um, in that, uh, I, I, all these memories were flooding back, watching the old games and watching the way you guys weave that into what was happening in society at the time. 
And, uh, you know, I just, you know, I'm from Gary, Indiana. I grew up right next to Chicago. So I very much remember those times. And so what you were doing with the iPad was also what we were experiencing as viewers watching the whole documentary, which is what I found so, so uh, exciting about it. But go, go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. I was just going to say another moment. Um, I don't know if Jason knew this was about to happen, but um, early on in the first interview, um, he talks about this thing he'd read about the, the Chicago Bulls in those early days, disaster. You know, the Bulls came into the league in 66 and they were going on almost 20 years and never even smelled a title. And he comes into this wreckage of a team. And Jason says it was described as the flying cocaine circus. And we watch Michael's reaction. He'd never heard that expression before. So like Jason is, as Nina said, this is a man who's been interviewed every day of his life. And now he's just heard a phrase that he, and he, he has this rollicking laugh and Jason's in like, all right, this is going to be good. It was kind of a litmus test because he could have said, ah, come on, that's funny next, you know, or that's sillier. But he just leaned in and described the debauchery, you know, the lines, we, the girls, I mean, he went through it chapter and verse. And I mean, Jason can, can speak for himself on that moment, but it was kind of like, okay, here we go. He's, you know, right. it's Jordan. He's, was he's only, that, was, that was only 20 minutes into that first interview. And that's, that's, wow. that's, probably the the that that's the fulcrum moment for the entire project to me in terms of the the shoots that we did because as mike <laughs> said he could have easily bobbed and weaved his way through that question not only did he laugh which acknowledges that it's true right. he then offered the anecdote of him being a kid in peoria straight from chapel hill and knocking up he's such a great storyteller mm -hmm. knocking on the door and he whispers and he's playing characters and he's goes in and says the whole team's there and there's lines, weed, and women. That wasn't even on the board for those side bets we were making with the camera crew that day. We never mentioned whether or not he mentioned lines, weeds, or women. Um, or, yeah, lines, weed, or women. That was as much an indication that this was going to be uh, a, about, you know, people rather than players as any moment in the entire doc. Right. Now, um, you you mentioned that that Mike said that, you know, no question was off limits and he allowed you to talk about whatever you wanted. Uh, but there were some players who seemed to have expressed some misgivings when uh, the doc rolled out. And Scottie Pippen, I guess, would be the most prominent one. Um, th there's some sense that he felt like he was uh, badly portrayed. So have you heard from players like that? And what do you tell them when they say uh, they feel that the documentary made them look bad in a way that they weren't comfortable with? I haven't heard from Scottie Pippen. And Scottie Pippen has never said publicly anything about this documentary. That's what I've learned now in, in the last couple of months is, is how the, the media works and how the press works. And one rumor turns into another rumor. And it's what, what that started from was if I were Scottie Pippen, I would be upset. And then th that one person says that to somebody else on first take or something. And it's, well, I talked to him and I think he might be upset. All of a sudden, Scottie Pippen's upset. Scottie Pippen has never spoken on record about this documentary. And we had a fantastic experience with him. And I have tremendous respect for him. And I will say this, we did our best throughout this entire documentary to reflect everybody's story honestly. Scottie's first and foremost, among Michael and Jerry Krause and everybody else that, that people would ask about. But there's a reason why we spent the money and the time to go back to Hamburg, Arkansas and interview people who knew Scotty in his formative years. There's a reason why we demonstrated the abject poverty from which he came. There's a reason why we show what an underdog this was and that he lived with 14 people under one roof, two of whom were in wheelchairs. There's a reason why he signed a seven year, $18 million contract in 1991, which people made fun of him for on the outside. But there's a reason why we wanted to tell that whole story was to defend Scottie Pippen and show why he made that decision. Now, the decisions he made leading up to the 97, 98 season, I can't defend those. We had to portray those to tell the story the right way, to be a true documentary, true journalism, as, as some people would call it. Uh, mm -hmm. But by the end of this thing, Scottie Pippen's performance in game six as Chip Schaefer, the, the trainer says, is the toughest he's ever seen any athlete give. 
everyone I know what it's like to pull my back out. Scotty Pippen gritted his way through not just two months of playoff basketball with a bad back, but the most important game of the Bulls dynasty with no back whatsoever. He gritted his way through it as a decoy for them to win that game. And then at the end of the series says that the guy who was his arch enemy in episode one and two is the greatest GM of all time. So if Scotty is upset with the doc, then I truly feel bad about that. He's never said on record that he is. And we did our best to portray his story as honestly as we could. The, the irony of it, Eric, is just anecdotally being in the world and kind of living this for five weeks plus, um, I would say the reaction I got most often, like who, who surprised you the most? Who did you identify the most? Who did you feel best about? Was Scotty Pippen. Um, seriously, there was a, the way Jason, the way he described it, um, and when you come back from those interviews and you see him giving up, leaving a lot of money on the table, I mean, seven years for 18 million, you know, he's not gonna starve, but as Jerry Reinsdorf, the owner of the Bulls said, he left a lot of money on the table. The owner of the team told him, you shouldn't take this. It's not maximizing your, your revenue potential. But he understood that he had two people in wheelchairs at home. And so he was the 122nd highest paid player, even though he might have been one of the top 10 players, if not top five players in the league. People came away sympathetic, understood how difficult it is to be the Robin to Michael Batman. Um, there's a lot of heart there. Now, he did some other things. Um, you know, he didn't go back in that game against the Knicks. Um, yeah. And he said, I wouldn't do it any differently. I mean, he made his bed and he's still sleeping in it, right? You know, there was yeah. the my game. It was just one of those things. As Jason said, we're telling the story. There was some unfortunate bad timing, some things where, you know, he didn't deliver for whatever reasons. But it was a really, really honest, I think, sympathetic portrait. And, you know, when he took that $18 million contract, he said, my day will come. Well, in fact, just for the record, he ends up making more money in career salary from the NBA than Michael Jordan. He made you know, more, more than $100 million. So he did okay. His day came. <laughs> Eventually, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and what's interesting to me, so um, I love how the documentary sets up this situation where uh, we're introduced to the concept that Jerry Krause kind of tells Phil Jackson, this is your last year, and the concept of the last dance right from the first episode. And so we know that these guys are playing, knowing that the, the, uh, the organization is going to rebuild the team. Uh, many of them are going to be gone. Phil Jackson's going to be gone, and Michael Jordan's probably going to be gone because he won't play for a coach other than Phil. Um, and, and, and at the end of the doc, you sort of return to that um, and that idea of like, why did they do that? Why did they do that? And I, I was thinking that myself the whole time when I was watching the doc. But what also struck me was the way Michael Jordan's competitive instinct works. And, and I wound up wondering, would they have won that, that season um, if the, the management hadn't laid down that huge challenge to Michael to basically say, you know, prove us wrong. You know, prove us that, prove to us that we need to keep this team around. And he seemed to take it that way and use that as fuel for the whole season. Did, does that make any, any kind of sense? Uh, that's what struck me when I was watching it. I haven't heard it put that way. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, Michael at that point in his career needed, as, as we examined in, in, in episode eight and, and beyond, he needed to conjure rivals. He needed to conjure reasons to keep on getting up and playing uh, as hard as he could. Um, but I, I also believe, as, as we talked about him playing against Larry when he was six and, and, and uh, crying after he didn't make the team when he was 15 and, um, you know, being motivated by not being on the cover of SI when he was a freshman at UNC and hitting a huge shot when he was a freshman in 1982, I think it's in his DNA. And I think it's in his family's DNA. Um, that, that's, that's the environment in which he grew up, is that you give your best at all times, no matter what. Was it a, a greater motivator? Sure, definitely. That, you know, he wanted to be able to say, I'm sure at the end of, of, of that sixth championship season, why would you break this up? It's obvious you shouldn't. Um, but I think he would have found a way. Someone would have walked out of a restaurant and, and would have pissed him off, or <laughs> someone would have looked at him the wrong way. Someone would have talked to him. Someone would have not talked to him. 
somebody would have, uh, you know, sung the wrong song uh, in, in, be, be before the opening tip of some playoff game. Michael finds ways to win, to convince himself to win. So uh, as much of a motivator as I think that that was that year, I don't, I think that they still would have done what they did. That makes sense. So um, what's interesting to me too, I mean, when you look at the success of the last dance, it seems to be one of those sports docs that kind of has crossed the threshold from being uh, a doc that sports fans know to being something that's had an impact in the general culture. And the last time I remember that really happening was um, OJ Made in America. Uh, and, and I'm wondering if you guys have any thoughts about what it takes for a sports documentary to cross that threshold, to go from being something excellent that sports fans know to having the kind of impact in the culture that we've seen The Last Dance have? You know, I mean, I worked on both of them. <laughs> well, um, I don't think I would call OJ a sports documentary, so that's where I would start. Right. I think it's a lot of things, and it's about a lot of things. I think sports is a minor aspect of it, and I think The Last Dance is, is a true American sports story in every way. Um, and, you know, we struggled and worked very hard on that very question, which is how do you both not bore the sports audience, but how do you interest the 15 year old who doesn't really know who Michael Jordan is? I mean, they, they, they think he just does shoes, but doesn't really know. Um, and, and, you know, part of it came through a lot of team discussions and a part of it came through sort of who we decided to hire. So you know, our editors weren't all basketball fans because I feel like that would defeat the purpose. Like, you know, if you are making the story with Jason, you have to be able to step away and be like, wait, does this make sense to, sense to me? Or like, do I know that they already won four championships? Like, or is it just, you know, built into my brain because I lived through it? So um, I think, a, you know, that was actually, I think, in my opinion, one of the hardest um, sort of so uh, the problems we had to solve um and it was very rewarding to see that you know it worked uh but i credit jason a lot who's you know breathed this problem for years um so we all have you um, and nina nina is the one who you know when when it was first was clear that this was going to happen connor shell from espn called me and said um i'm never going to i'm not going to get in your way I want you to have fun with this. We hired the right guy, blah, blah, blah. Hire Nina Kerstich. He said, you'll thank me. She was <laughs> the heart and soul of the OJ doc. She, she can wear many hats and, and she, is, she will be vital to the success of your doc. Hire her. So she was my first phone call. Um, and we, we spoke and I'm so glad that Connor made that call to me because I probably at that point would have said, I'm gonna do my own thing and I'll find my own people and whatever. Nina has a, a, a Rolodex, both physical and mental of so many talented people in this business and all of the, you know, I've, I brought a few of my people who I've trusted for a few projects in, but everyone else that we hired in this team, we, we made a concerted effort not to hire from the sports documentary pool uh, which I've worked in and swam in for, you know, 22 years or 20 years at that point, whatever it was. Um, but we wanted to get people who had fresh takes and fresh ideas and may, may, may know who Scotty Pippen is, but they don't know what the triangle offense is. They, don't, they, they couldn't tell you a zone from a man to man, but they know who Michael Jordan is and how famous he is and why they may be interested in certain aspects of his life and, and of this story. So I credit Nina, um, to opening those doors and opening my mind to hiring these people because it really came down to hiring the right collection of people who specified in, in certain areas because we, by the time we, we, this thing was moved up to, to air two months early, we needed everyone to hit their area of strength. So who's best at editing, you know, musical montages, who's best with story that hasn't, doesn't have to do with basketball, who's best at, at editing basketball highlights and game footage everyone then uh, had honed their, their role to a razor sharp tip and, and uh, everyone was, was in the right place at the right time at that point. And I credit Nina at, at the genesis of this thing um, for, for that. All right. Uh, well, I don't mean to cut you guys off, but 
we've run out of time and I feel like I could talk to you for another hour. I could do, I could do a Michael Jordan level interview. I could talk to you for another three hours about this, but uh, we're going to have to cut it short. So I'm going to kick it back to the folks from the IDA. Uh, Cassidy is going to uh, take us home and, uh, but thank you so much uh, to Jason Hare, Mike Tallin and Nina Kerstick uh, from the last dance. Thank you. Thanks Eric. Yeah. Yes, thank you all. Thank you, Eric. Uh, as always, um, that was great. My colleague Nikki and I were just geeking out in the back. We just loved it so much. It was so wonderful. So um, we're all, I'm a Scottie Pippen fan. She's a Michael Jordan fan. So we're always uh, going, going head to head on it. But uh, I, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, as I said before, we have one more conversation. Um, you can RSVP at documentary.org. But thank you, Eric. Jason, Nina, and Mike. Uh, this was wonderful. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, bye. bye.